Uh, thank you, first of all, to, uh, to Michael and Stefan for inviting me here uh, this evening. Uh, it was a very nice train journey up the East Coast line, a lovely evening with the sun setting and everything, so I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, and nice to see so many people turning out at, sort of on a dark autumn evening as well. So, uh, yes, I'm from York. That's part of our campus with this weird spaceship sort of like building in the middle of, of the lake, um, which is where we'd have our degree ceremony. Um, which is a bit disappointing, actually, because we've got beautiful York Minster in the centre of town, but we don't do our degree ceremonies there. But you're going to see a bit of York Minster in a, and hear a bit of York Minster in a, in a few slides' time. So, um, my talk is called Strategies in Acoustic Simulation. I've packed quite a lot in, um, so I might get through things quite quickly, but um, I'm more than happy to take any questions afterwards, um, and, and we'll see how we go. This is what we're going to... And, and kind of the tagline is Big Rooms and Small Voices. So it's an overview the sort of virtual acoustics research we've been doing in the audio lab in York for quite some time, uh, some of which is my work, some of which is my colleagues' work, um, and uh, again, it gives you a flavour of, of, of where we are and where we're going um, and some of the results that we've achieved most recently and what we would like to do in the future. So um, I'm going to do a bit of introduction in terms of the sort of the foundation for this work and our motivation and, and thinking about the sound of our acoustic environment. Then I'm going to move on and talk about the acoustic modelling work that we do that's mainly focused in room acoustic simulation and some of the, again, the recent work that we've done that looks at boundary modelling and source directivity modelling and space modelling, all with a view to developing new means of oralisation, so ultimately modelling spaces and rendering them in a way that sounds realistic. Um, and again, some of the more recent things that we've been working on in terms of trying to make our simulations run more efficiently. Then we're going to move beyond that and think about the practical application of this work. Uh, and there's three examples that we're going to look at, which is one uh, to do with objective and subjective testing of the oralizations that we produce, uh, which is actually focused on recreating the sounds of the past, interestingly. We're going to look at some soundscape oralization, which is quite new for us, which is moving outside, quite literally, from our rooms into the outdoor environment and thinking about the noise problems that we have to deal with there. And then at the very end, we're going to talk a bit more about our vocal tract modeling work, which is simulating very, very, very small spaces, which is the vocal tract and trying to synthesize human voice. So, um, our acoustic environment, I'm sure you're all well versed in, in what this is about, but ultimately every space that we go and um, uh, enter we ha have a, has an acoustic context within which we kind of explore it by our own voice and the, and the sounds that we make. Again, you can always spot an acoustician because they walk into a room and kind of go... <laughs> Um, because they're listening for the sound of the room, the impulse response of the room, and we deal with this kind of acoustic context on a day-to-day -day basis when we're speaking and talking in various places. One of the obvious ones is the shower. Um, the shower lends itself in a particular way to the sound that's produced in there. It's a small space, a small volume, but bright, hard surfaces that make it sound quite reverberant, and that reverberation in the shower encourages us to sing, because reverberation makes us sing better and sing in tune, and makes us perhaps sound better than we are. So it's a, it's a space that lends itself um, to interaction that perhaps we have understand on a day-to-day -day basis. At the other end of this scale, we have in our own city, York Minster. York Minster is one of the is the biggest Gothic cathedral in the Alps in Europe, and um, again, it's a space that demands uh, acoustic interaction when we walk into it because it sounds so spectacular. And uh, a number of years ago, we took our measurement kit in there and we measured the impulse responses of uh, York Minster. And this is what it sounds like. Well, first of all, you're going to hear uh, a singer in our anechoic chamber. And this singer is going to make a, a number of appearances over the course of the next hour or so in various uh, examples. So here she is. And then by taking that anechoic material and rendering it through the impulse responses, the acoustic fingerprints of York Minster, then we can place her within the space and she sounds like this. So it's a beautiful, big, dense, reverberating acoustic environment, not very good for speech, but perfect for choral singing, solo singing, organ music, traditional, traditional kind of uh, English sort of um, uh, liturgy. Um, and uh, again, we went and took some measurements of that, and that's what it sounds like. 
Now, at the other end of kind of the acoustic modeling side of things, there are some spaces that perhaps we want to consider that we can't actually go in and measure. So here's an example of a project we worked on a number of years ago, which is Coventry Cathedral. This is what it looks like now. It was destroyed in the Second World War, and we were asked to do an acoustic reconstruction of that building uh, to try and get a sense of what it would have sounded like in the 15th century. And so we built a rather crude looking but hopefully accurate sounding acoustic model and I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean in terms of accuracy with situations like this um, in, a, in a little while. Um, it looks like this and here is our singer heard in the rendering of Coventry Cathedral. So hopefully you appreciate that there's similarities and there are differences there between Coventry Cathedral Reconstructed and, and York Minster. Um, clearly they're different spaces, different size spaces, different volume spaces, but there's an important difference in terms of one was an actual measurement and one is an acoustic rendering using a particular modelling technique. And uh, I won't turn into the lecturer and ask you as to what the differences are, but I'll, I'll, I'll make that clearer for you in that hopefully you, if we li listen more carefully between the two, York Minster sounds warmer, it sounds more balanced, it sounds more natural for a voice, whereas perhaps this sounds brighter, sounds harsher. And one of the reasons for that is the modelling technique that's been used in this case is not very good at low frequencies, and I'll expand on that in a, in a few slides' time. So the model there was done with a uh, package called Odeon. Uh, it's a geometric modelling technique, geometric acoustics technique. It uses a ray tracing algorithm to predict what the acoustic fingerprint or the impulse response of the space is. So what you can see here is how one of those rays is being traced around the space and it has a number of interactions with the bounding geometry. One can then trace what happens at each interaction and apply the filtering appropriately so that when it hopefully it arrives at the receiver or the listening point, you've got a sense of how that sound is propagated through the space. But there's a number of things that are kind of less ideal about that. It's a very, it is a random process. So you have to determine some rules as to how that ray of, of sound is going to interact with the space. And you have to determine at some point whether it's being detected or not, or whether you truncate the modeling and say, well, that ray is, a lot, is effectively lost to the receiver. It's not going to arrive there. So it is a random process. And of course, it's assuming that sound behaves as a ray of light, which of course it doesn't. And I'll come back to that in a moment as to some of the consequences of that. If we wanted to take a more accurate approach, then we could perhaps explore something called the image source technique. It's a geometrical acoustic technique again. So it, it predicts the impulse response based on following paths around the room and interpreting the geometry of the space and working out how sound uh, reflects and absorbs at, at different boundaries. But rather than this case it being uh, a random process, this one is a predictive process and it tries to work out which of the rays that you're firing off into the space will actually arrive at the receiver. And so to do this, rather one can imagine this first order reflection here um, and instead of actually tracing this path, one can actually construct a mirror in the, in the boundary that you're interested in and you get this image source and that straight line path from the mirror image source to the receiver is equivalent to that path there and you take into account the interaction that's happened due to the reflection and absorption of this boundary and you deal with it when it actually arrives at the receiver. Similarly, here's a second order reflection and we make a, mi a mirror image source of our first order mirror image source. So we take a reflection in this wall here, which corresponds to the two surfaces being interacted with in this path length here. And again, we get an equivalent path that corresponds to that second order reflection. And so it goes on. And, and this enables us to make an exact prediction of what the impulse response of the space However, it only really works nicely when you've got a nice shoebox shaped room that tessellates nicely and you can co construct the mirror image sources very easily. Beyond that, of course, it also um, uh, increases geometrically in terms of the computational complexity of the, of the algorithm. So generally, it's only used for the first uh, order reflections that you will find in the space. So it's exact, but it's computationally expensive and it only really applies nicely in sort of uh, geometries that tessellate nicely in the 2D or the 3D plane. So geometric acoustics, generally, they, they are used quite a lot um, in industry to do predictions of building spaces, models, to reconstruct buildings that don't exist, to predict the sound of a concert hall that hasn't been built yet. And so they generally work quite well over most of the audible spectrum. However, their accuracy is limited by the, the, the parameters that you place on the algorithm. A ray trace is going to be accurate in terms of the number of reflections you're prepared to deal with, in terms of the randomization of the path lengths through the space, and the number of rays and surface interactions you take account of. Image source is dependent upon how long you're prepared to wait for the algorithm to calculate. It's relatively efficient. You can do a real a 
limited real-time implementation, it's possible to gather the first reflection fairly efficiently and render those in real time. But most importantly, its low frequency response is not accurate. You can't replicate the low frequency content of the sound of a space using a method like this that assumes sounds behave as a ray of light. And similarly, or as a consequence of that, it can't model diffraction well unless you build in more complexity to the algorithm and it can't do sound occlusion very well either. So the low frequency wave behavior of sound is effectively lost from the approach. So the solution then comes in a wave-based acoustic simulation. So again, you take a, a bounding geometry, a geometrical file that determines the size and the shape of the space, the boundary materials, and what you have within it. And in this case, what you do is you build a grid of points. You sample the space in both space and time. And across that space, you then solve what we've got down here, the linear wave equation in three dimensions for that particular space. And the result is, by considering the interaction of a wave injected into one of these grid points, is natural uh, acoustic wave propagation, as you can see here on the right-hand side, which gives kind of nice, sort of very pleasing to look at uh, wave propagation effects. And you can see diffraction effects. And you can see, uh, again, we've got kind of some sort of flutter echo being set up here and so on. So it lends itself well to, in theory, um, solving the wave equation and giving us something that will hopefully give us an accurate impulse response of the space. And, it's, and it will definitely have the low frequency uh, effects that are missing from a geometric solution. So the two ways that we've looked at simulating wave propagation using a wave-based approach is, is either using the digital waveguide mesh or a finite difference time domain solution. And so it all comes down to defining the rules that determine how a signal propagates from the different points in the sampling grid that you've established in your space. And so the first method, which is uh, kind of arrived from digital waveguides or was extended from digital waveguides in the early 90s um, and applied to multidimensional systems, is the digital waveguide mesh, where essentially you've got a traveling wave solution that enables you to predict how sound is going to propagate from point to point in the grid by considering the incoming and outcoming points from point to point here. And so it's a three-step process of calculating the sound pressure at a junction based on the incoming wave components, calculating what the outgoing wave components would be, and then propagating the signal from point to point. Now, we did a lot of work in that in, in sort of the early 2000s, uh, but since then, we did a much more uh, sort of uh, efficient and robust solution using the finite difference time domain method. As you can see from these block diagrams that describe the algorithm, they're quite similar, but the algorithm for the finite difference time domain technique for three dimensions is much simpler, it's much more efficient to code, and therefore it applies itself well to large spaces where you're trying to do this as quickly as possible. However, even though a lot of work has done on finite differences in virtual acoustics work in more recent years, there's still a place to play for the waveguide mesh, and I'll, play, I'll show you some examples of that as we go through um, the, the rest of this talk. So here's some examples of the advantages that we do get from our wave-based approach. First of all, you can probably just about see here we've got sort of a sort of traditional sort of coupled room problem. So we've got a sound source and a receiver in this space here and we've fired off an impulsive sound at the source point and we can see how the wave propagates out through the space and we've got another receiver in the neighboring room and we have an opening you can just about see there and there so that sound propagates through and diffracts into the neighboring room and the impulse responses that we get at the first and second receiver are traditionally what we'd expect in those circumstances so with the source receiver in the same room, you've got the direct sound and early reflections, and then you've got a quite strong reverberant field. But in the neighboring room, we have no direct sound or very attenuated direct sound, no early reflections, or again, very attenuated early reflections and attenuated vibrations. So you get a sense that the sound is next door rather than in the room with you. And that's typically what you get in a coupled room problem. So occlusion and diffraction we get for free out of the algorithm. And it also does low frequencies very, very well, too. So this isn't a room at all. This is a two-dimensional circular membrane. And it's very easy to predict what the resonant frequencies of that membrane would be. So you can see here the first eight modes of resonance simulated using, uh, in this case, it's the digital waveguide mesh. Um, and we can see here what the predicted frequencies should be. And we can see here what the actual frequency response of the, of the, of the system is. And they line up very, very well. So you do get good low frequency uh, response using these methods. So um, we developed a system at York called the Render Air System to enable us, it was a research platform to effectively enable us to do more efficient research in, 
testing these algorithms and working with them. Um, it was inspired by programs like Odeon and CAP that work in the geometrics domain, geometric acoustics domain for doing oralization. And initially it was there to enable us to try different means of trying different sampling grids and different boundary methods to try and optimize what we were doing and get some good results effectively. Um, and we used that for a number of years, but unfortunately um, it became quite cumbersome to manage. So it still exists, but uh, it's not perhaps in its most stable state because various people have contributed it to, to it over a number of years. So our most recent work is taking advantage of kind of open source solutions. So we're just about to present a paper at AES 49th conference in February next year, um, where we have basically taken the modeling engine from RenderAir um, and we've implemented it in Blender. So Blender is an open source 3D graphics sort of manipulation and design package um, and we've built into it, it's quite easy to extend Blender with different modules, we've basically built in acoustic sort of absorption and acoustic and receiver information into Blender and this then writes that acoustics information into a Blender file that you can we then drop into our modeling engine it's a much more efficient way of doing the design time work and managing how to manipulate or want to design or experiment with different spaces rather than having to code everything from scratch um, and so basically you do your design work in blender uh, you export the results and then you load it into our uh, modeling engine and it does what's called a voxelization of the space so there's lots of algorithms that can quite effectively voxelize out the space and tell you where and you know, design a, a, a a sampling grid effectively within the space and the sampling grid interrogates the boundaries to find out whether it's a soft boundary or a hard boundary and what the acoustic properties are so that can feed into the engine and then you can put the appropriate boundary terminations in. So we're about to present a paper on, on some of the work using Blender to do our acoustic design front end at this conference next year and that's again we hope it's going to be a much more extensible and open source way of presenting our and doing our modeling work because Blender is obviously open source as well. Um, okay, so Blender is the, t the means to which we can do our design work. We still need to, to do the core algorithm and um, a lot of work most recently has um, focused on trying to get the boundaries working correctly, particularly from the point of view of a room acoustic simulation. So that's about doing frequency dependent absorption and diffusion at a boundary as well. So um, a lot of work was done by Konrad Kowalczyk and Martin van Wallenstein um, on how you design uh, an appropriate locally reacting surface that can plug into the basic finite difference time domain algorithm that you're going to use to solve your wave propagation in your 3D space. And so we've been doing some testing of those um, uh, boundaries now in more realistic um, uh, situations. So what you see here is some tests that we've done. It's going, this is going into a paper that's currently in review. So this is all kind of, you know, has a caveat as to the results that you're seeing. The reviewers might need to make some comments on what you're seeing here. So this is a shoebox room. And in a shoebox room, it's actually quite easy to use the image source technique to generate the impulse response. It will be exact. The image source technique in such a simple situation actually solves the wave equation. So with an appropriate calibration of the finite difference technique and the image source technique, we get very, very good results, very good agreement between the modal responses of the shoebox shape. So what you see here is positive reflection coefficients at the boundary. And you can probably just about see, so if we look at the orange line, there's a solid orange line and a dotted orange line. The solid one is the finite difference method. The dotted line is the image source method, and then we've done it for lots of different reflection coefficients, and so that's one with almost total reflection, and you can see as we move towards close, close to total absorption, um, again, you get good agreement between um, the, the two algorithms. Similarly, if we just test how the reflection and the absorption behavior is happening at a boundary, and we compare it with the image source technique again, you can see here we get very good agreement as we change the reflection coefficient with angle of incidence, um, again, both for the solid line, which is finite difference, and the dotted line, which is image source. Finite difference doesn't work so well uh, with kind of very sharp angles of incidence, and that's because of the grazing effect of the of, of material that we're actually testing. Um, but uh, other than kind of at, at those angles, it's, it gives very good agreement. Um, and we did initially back in 2010 a very simple sort of first go at how we can, again, use a shoebox room and vary the absorption characteristics and compare it with existing metrics such as Sabin uh, reverberation time calculation, Norris airing reverberation time uh, calculation and then also we used a ray tracing model and this also used the uh, three-dimensional um, uh, diffusion equation as well rather than the wave equation to actually test this and that gave reasonably good results but uh, 
done a bit more since then. So this was basically testing the work that Conrad and Martin had done, uh, that, and, and they defined and, and um, uh, characterized these boundaries, and where we've been applying them in slightly more real-world circumstances and putting them up against existing modeling techniques and give, once calibrated, very good agreement. So some other work that I did in, in collaboration with uh, Conrad and Martin was looking at the diffus diffusion problem at a boundary. So again, from the point of view of acoustic design, diffusion is very important in terms of both optimizing a room where you might want to build a diffusing material into the boundary so that you get rid of problematic reflections or room modes, or in realistic room circumstances where you might have a quite a coarse boundary uh, that doesn't give you it has a sort of natural effect, which what we're seeing here, we're assuming we've got quite a rough uh, boundary. And so, again, we did some comparisons um, in terms of how this method uh, can compare with real world or as close to real world uh, measurements that we could get. And so the approach taken here is the first is, well, if we've got this surface that we're trying to approximate and we want to see how it diffuses sound, well, the first thing is to approximate it quite coarsely by actually gridding out the space to a certain degree such that it looks like the boundary that we're trying to simulate. But it has to be quite coarse because obviously to do sort of this level of detail we'd need a very, very fine sampling grid which would be computationally quite expensive. But then the other approach that was taken was to build in delays into the boundary, into the frequency dependent absorption filters effectively that enables us to, as well as doing the absorption, also enables us to do the diffusion. So effectively there's a delay path, and this is how a typical um, optimized diffuser works. There's a delay path into the wells of this diffuser that then reflect back with an appropriate um, phase difference and therefore you get cancellations and so on. And you can simulate that rather than having to grid it out directly by actually building in delays into the boundaries. And so here's a quite nice result that shows three different cases. So we've got a flat surface. So this is kind of modeling a flat surface material to give you an idea of how it diffuses sound. And this is, again, a sort of a fairly standard, well-defined uh, metric for measuring the diffusion coefficient of a particular material. And so we've taken a boundary element model, which gives as close to one might get as an exact uh, approximation. And then we've taken the staircase model, which is this approach, which gives reasonably good approximation. And then we've got our um, a delay uh, boundary approach, which again gives a very good match. As we get higher up in frequency, it gets less accurate. And that's down to the sampling grid actually being used and the fact that the higher in frequency finite difference time domain that technique, the less accurate it is, and we run into other problems such as diffusion, uh, sorry, dispersion error effects, which I'll come back to again in a few slides time. So in terms of developing something that's going to work well for a room acoustic simulation, pot potentially boundary coefficients have been well defined now and been tested, and similarly so have diffusion coefficients. And so this is, this is a technique that's, that's more ready to be applied in real world um, circumstances. Other cases that need to be considered, directional sources, again, just inject a signal into the grid and propagate it outwards, then it's typically got an omnidirectional characteristic. However, it's quite easy or quite difficult, depending on how detailed you want this result to be, to impart a directional source. And of course, most acoustic material that you want to listen to in the space, for instance, like our, signal, our singer that you heard early on, has got a directional characteristic. Um, and so you want to model that as well as you can. And it's actually very easy to get a first order directional response, which is uh, a cardioid type pattern, if you know a little bit about microphone design, or a figure of eight type pattern. And in this case, all we need to do is to take, rather than injecting a signal at one point, we inject the signal at two points, we phase reverse one, and we apply a delay to the second signal. And the cancellation between the two, the differential between the two excitation points, gives you something here, as you can see, that behaves reasonably like a cardioid directivity pattern across the frequency spectrum. As you can see, the magnitudes change quite a lot, and there's various reasons for that, um, but the actual directional response is, is reasonably good. And so we did a little bit of work in fine-tuning that somewhat, and by changing the delay time uh, and introducing a fractional delay between the two signals that are injected, it's possible to get any first order um, directivity pattern from a dipole pattern, so a figure of eight pattern, to hypercardioid, supercardioid, cardioid, or subcardioid, and then back to omnidirectional again. So it's a cheap and easy way of doing a directional source. It's also possible to do much more 
accurate directional source uh, um, uh, approaches, but it does involve having to kind of then map out the particular directional characteristic you're trying to simulate um, in your, uh, for your sound source, uh, and it does come with additional kind of caveats and problems. But this is a nice, simple way of doing it, and it lends itself to um, some of the approaches that we're thinking about in terms of our future work. So again, I'll come back to that and reflect on that uh, in a few slides' time. And it's also the case that that kind of directional source actually came out of the work that we spent quite a lot of time doing, which is how one encodes the signal in our models such that we can reproduce it accurately over multiple loudspeakers. So all the examples you're hearing today are in stereo, so there's only so much spatial accuracy one can get in stereo, but ultimately we want to render these spaces using potentially either binaural results, so it's just over 3D sound using headphones, or using multiple loudspeakers so that you're placing the listener in the virtual acoustic environment that you've designed and simulated. And so the approach that we took with this is based on something called ambisonics, which again you may have heard of. And ambisonics is a, a very kind of neat um, means of, of encoding and rendering spatial sound because effectively it, it disassociates the coding part of the of the, uh, the information gathering from the rendering part. Most other spatial audio systems have a fixed picture in terms of how you're going to render the sound as to how you then capture it. Whereas with ambisonics, if you capture the, the sound field effectively, you can render it in many, many different ways. For instance, mono for stereo, for a 5.1 for wave field synthesis if you wish as well. And the, the, the kind of the archetypal typical well-known microphone used in ambisonics is this is the sound field mic, which looks like that if you take it out of its capsule. And so effectively what we were trying to do is to simulate the sound field microphone but in our finite difference time domain grids so that we could effectively ambisonically encode um, our, our, our oralizations and then render them over loudspeakers. So ambisonic B format works as follows. Effectively, one can consider it in two ways. The easiest and most intuitive way to think about it is that you've got four microphones co-located at one point in space. The first, the zeroth order component, or the W channel as it's known, is an omnidirectional microphone. And then you've got three first order components that are orientated at 90 degrees to one another on the Keynesian axes. So you've got X, Y, and Z. So front, back, left, right, and up, down. Um, but this also form, forms the first four components of a spherical harmonic series. And although the sound field microphone can reproduce up to first order very well and therefore decode and render those results very well, for better spatial accuracy, which implies that you can detect where a sound is coming from over your speaker array more accurately, and also that the sweet spot at the center of the array works for more than one listener, then you need to go to higher orders. And so there's quite a lot of work and research at the moment in spatial audio and ambisonics looking at higher order methods both in terms of encoding and higher order microphones and then how they can also be decoded and optimized for different speaker arrays in different ways. So our approach to this was initially quite straightforward and simple and it kind of relates back to the source material that you've, the directional source work you've already seen. And so basically if we've got two omnidirectional receivers that receive sound equally from every angle, then if we take the difference between those two receivers to give a differential, therefore a gradient rather than a pressure signal, then effectively we get a dipole response, we get a figure of eight response. So that figure of eight response corresponds quite nicely to the first order components in an ambisonic array. And so that was fairly straightforward. We tested that, and yes, it works quite nicely. But then the question is, how do we go to higher orders from this sort of first order basis? Well, um, when the ambisonic sound field microphone was first being designed and tested, um, this, this idea of a differential microphone array was also proposed and examined. And basically, if we can apply the same technique, so we take our first order velocity microphones, pressure gradient microphones, and by taking the difference between those two microphones, effectively we end up with the next harmonic series components. So from second order, we take our two figure of eight components and take them away from one another, or this is algorithm starts a little bit more sort of um, cleverly optimized, I guess, for what we're, where we're going to go with it. If we phase invert one of those, then we can add them together, then effectively you get what's called the typical clover leaf pattern, which is the second order horizontal directivity characteristic that you'd want from a second order microphone. Uh, and so that can effectively be done from four points in your sampling grid, whereas the first order was taken from two points in the sam sampling grid. And of course, yes, we can then take this method further. So if we take our two second order components uh, and we shift them sideways and take the differential between them again, we should get a third order um, uh, uh, response. Unfortunately, 
it doesn't quite work. And this is the directional response that you can get, or you get. And you can kind of see that, again, it's kind of going up the harmonic series, but it's not quite there. You see that there's a bit of a shifting in terms of the directionality of these two lobes. Well, actually, it's very easy to fix that. And rather than taking our differential mic technique like this, if we shift these two points onto the radius of the circle on which we're taking our responses, then effectively we get the appropriate harmonic component that we're interested in. And so effectively we've gone from a differential microphone technique to a certain sampling technique that enables us, in theory, to get any um, uh, spherical harmonic order from a finite difference time domain grid. Um, and we spent a long time sort of formulating that method, and that's been published in a paper recently, which I'll show you in a moment. So practically, there are a number of things that one needs to think about. So this is how it works in theory. We have our, uh, a, a, a circular array of points, and from that circular array of points, you can construct the appropriate nth order spherical harmonic components that are needed so that you can render sound accurately over lots of loudspeakers. Practically, obviously, as these things always are, there's a few more things that have to be considered. So this is what we did to get a third order ambisonic encoding in our finite difference array um, or finite difference oralization scheme and actually what you can see is that we have to use multiple grids. The reason being to get something that works over the full audio spectrum then effectively you have to optimize the approach in different bandwidths and you have to use different sampling grids or different circular grids in your finite difference time domain sampling grid to get appropriately accurate results. So here's an example. So this we're trying to get our third order component response here from this, partic this particular grid and at very very low frequencies it falls down completely and the reason for that of course is that if we want to get accurate low frequency sampling we actually need quite a wide spacing to take the differentials for to generate our virtual microphone polar responses. So you need multiple grid spacings to get um, uh, the, the polar patterns that you need for the microphone microphones. At very high frequencies you get a problem as well again that you get non-optimized polar response and that is actually to do with the fact that you need optimized or ideal sampling points on your circular array to, to do the correct differenti differential um, uh, algorithm to get the right polar response. So you can see here in this example the points that we actually need to get the correct polar response are the ones that are circled here but the points we have available in the grid are kind of nearest neighbor. And so to actually get something that works uh, and would fix this problem, you actually have to interpolate the points as well to get the correct sampled points for the circular array that you're trying to um, simulate. So by taking all of these things into account, multiple grid spacings or multiple circular arrays across your grid for different frequency bands and interpolating the data to get the exact points you need for the, your circular array, it's possible to reconstruct uh, pretty much exactly um, the polar patterns that are needed for, in this case, a third order spherical harmonic encoding of our finite different time domain room acoustic simulation. I'll get you to repeat that back to me later on. So um, that's how it works in theory and we then did some um, extensive test subjective testing of this and so what we did is we took the direct sound that was simulated um, or a direct sound that was simulated in our finite difference time domain grid, we encoded it to third order then we took a sound and processed it directly using the ambisonic encoding equations and did a considerable lengthy spatial listening uh, test that shows that effectively there's no real difference between uh, sound encoded directly using the third order encoding equations and the sound simulated using our finite difference time domain grid and then encoded using the method we've just proposed. And so the dotted line is the ambisonic direct response and the solid line is the response that we've got from our finite difference time domain grid. Um, and so that gives us good confidence in the results and that's all been published recently in that paper that brings everything together. So let's take a breather in terms of thinking about how we're doing our wave-based acoustic simulation. So we've got something that theoretically solved the wave equation nicely for us. We've got uh, frequency dependent absorbing boundaries. We've got diffusing boundaries. We can simulate a source quite crudely but effectively to first order resolution and we've got quite an extensive means of encoding the sound accurately to any that we wish really so that we can replay the results back over any number of loudspeakers we're particularly interested in. There's still a problem with all of this in that ultimately 3D finite difference time domain modeling for good broadband acoustic simulation is still a very expensive technique and even beyond next generation CPUs. So a lot of work as some of you are probably aware has been done in how we can use for instance graphical 
processing units to speed this up. But we've been looking at other approaches as well as using GPUs to do that. And the obvious one is, well, we know that geometric acoustics works well at high frequencies. We know that wave-based approach works well at low frequencies. So why don't we hybridize the model and use a bit of both and try and give a, a global solution that takes the best of both rather than trying to crack a problem which still maybe needs a few generations of computing power to, to actually solve to do the finite difference time domain method um, in, in one box effectively. So our first go at this took um, our three-dimensional, in this case it was a digital waveguide mesh solution, to do the, the, the initial early time simulation, so to capture the early reflections correctly and also to do the response at low frequencies where we know that the geometric algorithm falls down. And then we used a 2D response to gather effectively the reverberant sound. And with a 2D metal model, you're only modeling a plane through the space, but it gives a reverberation that correlates well with the actual geometry you're simulating. And then we use our ray tracer in the top end to fill in the kind of the high frequency gaps. And so this is our first go with this. We did a music practice room in our music department um, and uh, we simulated it. And the first example you're going to hear is the geometric only algorithm. The second one is the hybridized algorithm that uses 3D uh, waveguide mesh effectively, uh, wave-based, uh, and the geometric approach at the high frequency. So here we go. And then the hybrid. And the obvious thing, I hope you agree, is that they sound different, yes? And what you, but what's actually different about them is that in the first case, you've got a very trebly bright response because there's nothing at the low end to compensate for that. Whereas in the, the second result, you've got something that produces a more balanced sound that has the appropriate low frequency resonances in what is actually quite a small room and balances it with the high end reverberation. So that was something we did a number of years ago. This is our first go at hybridizing the model. Um, but we've been doing a, a bit of work since then and we've got a new approach. And this is done with colleagues at, uh, at Alto University. So again, these results are from a, a paper that's currently going through the review process. So it should be dealt with um, uh, with that caveat in mind. And so this new approach basically um, kind of discards sort of the, the idea that um, we can use a, a two-dimensional solution and instead takes a more accurate approach, which is to use two different geometric-based approaches. One is beam tracing, and beam tracing is effectively a sort of generalized image source algorithm and the acoustic radiance transfer method, which we use for generating the reverberant field or the late tail of the response. And we do and combine this with the finite difference time domain method. And in theory, we'd want to do everything in the finite difference time domain sort of world, but if we have to set a cut fill in the results with either the to wait long enough for those results to come back they still take a long time to compute or we can use the acoustic radiance transfer method to get the reverberant late tail response if we want something that's done a lot shorter we combine the result then in octave bands resampling both algorithms as appropriate combine them and sum them apply an air absorption filter and that delivers then the final impulse response for the space in something that hopefully is a realistic amount of time so here are some results which show how this behaves. So um, we have here, it's quite complicated to read, I guess. So um, the two dotted lines are Norris Ehring and Sabin. So they're kind of, you know, the theoretical kind of reverberation time calculation. This is done for a shoebox room. So they kind of fall down a little bit in terms of their accuracy. And we're varying across these results with uh, reflection coefficient. That we've got reverberation time up on the y-axis. This one shows the average reverberation time varying with reflection coefficient for eight source receiver combinations averaged across the space. And this one shows it for one source receiver combination. So we see what it looks like when we're averaging over the space, which is what one should do when thinking about the acoustics of a space in general. And then we look at it, well, let's see what happens at one particular point so that we're not hiding any results in the averaging. And this outlier, first of all, is what we have proposed with our first method, which is the 2D simulation. So that's not non-ideal, particularly as you can see, it overestimates what the reverberation time can be. But then we also, as part of that earlier work, provo uh, proposed a compensation method so that, kind of, that filters the results and kind of time aligns it a little bit more, which is that dark solid line. And that's not too bad, but it's still not ideal. 
but we can see that we get very good agreement between the finite difference time domain method, the beam tracing ART method, um, uh, and we've also, because it's a shoebox room, calculated for the image source method. So they give very good a, a result. What you see here with the vertical lines are the just noticeable difference measures for reverberation time. So effectively, any result within here, you're not actually going to perceive the difference of. So all the results, although not exactly close, are close enough that you would be find it difficult to perceive the difference. And to give you an idea of what this looks like when we, when we combine the results, here's a, a slightly more complex space. It's sort of a typical simple concert hall. This is the impulse response that you get out of it. Again, you can see the early reflections are quite nicely modeled. These are the frequency domain results. You've got the finite difference method here and the beam tracing, beam tracing acoustic radiance transfer uh, geometric approach. Um, and you can see how they're matched. The finite difference method does require calibrating with the geometric approach, and that's again what a lot of the work of that paper actually proposes. But you can see what happens before and after calibration to get them to work. When they're summed, this is what you get. And then the final result, once the air absorption filter is applied, gives you this, which gives you a nice uh, generalized, um, uh, hopefully accurate impulse response. It sounds good. I don't have any audio examples for this one as yet, I'm afraid. When the paper is out, we'll, we'll have that. So um, that's kind of where we are with the work in terms of our acoustic modeling. Where we're kind of with the work or what we're hoping to do at York is to actually collaborate with our computer science department. Our computer science department have something called UShare and it's an initiative to try and put more research in the open world, in the, on, on, on the open source domain and to deliver it as a, as a software, as a service platform. So the idea being you could go and upload your results for any particular algorithm you're interested in that's been put on a grid of, uh, of computing nodes via a web page and it will give you back the results. So if you read a paper, for instance, and you wanted to replicate those results, you could take the results from the paper, upload them to the site, and you'd get the results back, save you having to recode it all yourself, for instance. And so this is kind of where we're going now. We're using Blender as our front-end design tool, and then we're taking an band approach to the acoustic simulation. In theory, we want something that's going to be done at the, in the finite difference domain all the way through, but of course we've seen that that's not practical as yet, um, and so we would farm off different octave bands to either tracing or whatever algorithm we're actually using. Then we have a response combiner that combines the results into a final impulse response and delivers them um, for you via a web page ultimately. And then with a bit more work in Blender, Blender has something called a game engine in, in part, in, as part of it, which means that once you've designed your 3D geometry, you can interact with it. And so the idea here would be you design your 3D space, upload it to UShare. UShare would farm off the processing across the grid in octave bands, combine the response, and then drop it back into Blender at the end so that you could actually listen and interact with the space. Uh, there's still obviously some way to go with this, but this is kind of a, a block diagram of our goal and where we would like to go with the work. Okay, so that's kind of the modeling side of things, and so let's talk a little bit more about the application side of things. So one of the things that kind of a number of years ago, a colleague of mine was doing PhD at the same time as me, as York, thought about when we were first sort of trying out these wave-based algorithms, was we knew they were never going to work on large spaces back then, um, but they would work quite well at low frequencies in small spaces. And so that's how we got interested in the idea of ancient acoustics and listening to the past, because... And, and this, this, again, my colleague kind of sort of said, well, look at this space here. We could do some modeling of this. And passage tombs that you find all over Scotland and Ireland and across Europe um, are small resonant spaces that have particular resonant frequencies that some researchers, both in acoustics and in archaeology, think have a particular characteristic that were important for how these spaces were used. And so we thought, well, they're small spaces. There are low-frequency effects in there that people kind of want to explore. So it's something that we could apply on. To. And that's how we first dipped our toe into the world of, um, sort of uh, historical or archaeological acoustics. Um, and that then sort of prompted a program of work where we've done a lot of measurement in various um, sites around the UK and a bit further afield where we do some acoustic measurement and we use effectively sound field microphone techniques to gather as much impulse response data for these spaces as we can. And then this can be used creatively by musicians or analytically by acousticians, or we can analyze the data and try and do simulations based on these spaces. And we've put all this information on our website, which I'll show you in a few moments. And from the measurement process, we go to the modeling process. And again, we've worked with uh, our archaeology department to look at how one goes about 
modeling accurately historical sites. And so archaeologists are very good these days at doing things like laser scanning of buildings. And so we're looking at how we can interpret this 3D data and generate appropriate acoustic models and try and come to see if we can come to some metric or some test that can tell us that the models that they're generating are acoustic as accurate they can be. So in some cases, like this church which is in Humberside, uh, which is East Yorkshire, um, the, the, kind of the survey work has already been done by the archaeology department, so we took that data and generated an acoustic model and we went and took the measurements of the space as well. In other cases, um, the place with the Coventry Cathedral example, the space doesn't really exist anymore and you've got to interpret the data using people who know about archaeology and history and architecture and so on to tell you how the space would have actually been at whatever period in time and then we've got to do our best to interpret that into an acoustic model. So here's an example of St Mary's Abbey in York um, and we presented this work at DAFEX in September um, and this is a first pass go at how we would um, simulate the, uh, the, 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 the space and as you can see the kind of the features of what is left of the building is quite um, uh, you know the features of our acoustic building are quite considerably less detailed um, and what we're questioning there is how much detail do we have to go to something to optimize the model to get it into a steady state response such that adding more detail doesn't necessarily add more to the acoustic um, uh, of what you're hearing and what, how that changes and to help us with that we're actually using a space in the center of York called the National Center for Early Music and uh, again we've done a lot of work in surveying that building both acoustically and geometrically and building models of that space and uh, the good thing about this building is that it has variable acoustic parameter pa um, uh, uh, panels in it so we can actually physically change the acoustics of the space measure those results and then we can input those changes into our models to see whether we can again perceive the changes and how we optimize the models against the, the space that we've actually got so this was the measurement process and we've done a lot of modeling and i'll just give you three quick examples um, of uh, of two models and one real measurement and the models have been done using different ways and the measurement is actually obviously from the space and uh, we'll do a quick show of hands as to which one you think is the real one. Um, I appreciate it's not the best place and the projector's quite noisy, so listen carefully. So we're going to have two examples that are models. One example that is measurement. See if you can pick out which one is the measurement. quite close yes so who thinks number one is real hands up who thinks number two is real hands up who thinks number three is real hands up <laughs> it's about kind of evenly split actually there's probably slightly more favoring this one and actually the real one is the third one uh, and these this one has been done in Odeon has been done in CAT and this one is our measurement and so we've optimized the boundaries as closely as we can against the measurements and they all sound different there's no doubt about it even OG and CAT give you different sounding results if you want to listen to them over headphones you can uh, and they sound different from the acoustic model but they're also I mean, from the acoustic measurement but they're also very very close and so we're trying to refine it and now we're actually going to go and measure the absorption coefficients of the boundaries in there so that we can uh, kind of say definitively um, that it's as close as we can get it. Uh, I'm running a bit short of time so I'm going to skip through um, some of uh, a little bit and, and cut to the chase a bit. If you want to find out a bit more about our acoustic measurement work we're putting it all online at this place called openairlib.net and so you can find all the acoustic measurements, all the acoustic data, um, and you can download it and analyze it. And it does some of the analysis online for you as well. There's also a database of anecdotal material um, that we've been doing to kind of supplement the acoustic impulse responses. And you can, you can do it, play around with it quite informally and listen to various sounds in various spaces, including things like the Hamilton Mausoleum, which is supposedly the longest reverberation time just outside of Glasgow. Um, and, uh, but also all the data is available for you to download and use in your own way if you so wish. So that's some of our work in internal spaces and the re what the goal here is trying to again take our objective measurements 
and subjectively verify them and show that we're getting as close as we can in terms of what we're listening to, but also in terms of the measurements that we're getting in terms of things, for instance, like reverberation time. But we're also starting to tackle the problem of outdoor um, sound oralization and soundscape oralization. And these are examples of something called a sonic crystal. Okay? So there's, there's a bit of kind of a trend in acoustic um, noise design at the moment to try and um, develop passive acoustic barriers that can act well, that can cancel sound more effectively and in a more aesthetically pleasing way than the traditional barriers you see, for instance, along roadsides and along train lines. Um, and this was first proposed or first kind of investigated when this was a, a structure that was built in, in Spain and these first effects were noted and then there was a, a large artistic project that ran last year where this thing called the organ of Corti was moved to various places around um, the UK in noisy environments to listen to how it affected the overall sound quality. And the goal here is, is about trying to reduce kind of our, the noisy environment in which we live. And this was a survey done in 2009 that says about 30% of people expressed dissatisfaction with their noisy environment. Um, but the noise that's in the environment is not damaging to hearing, so there's no de real desire to, 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 to fix it because it's not maybe an issue related to health and safety, but it's about quality of life rather than the quantity of the noise that's in it. And so the question here is, can sonic crystal structures provide an aesthetic uh, and effective way of, uh, of, uh, of environmental noise management? And it works basically because you've got, um, by having a regular series of insertions placed in a fluid, in this case air, you get particular phase cancellation effects that result in what are called brag peaks or band gaps. And this has been discovered and used in many areas of physics and science, but it scales up to the acoustic domain, if you wish. And so therefore, we've been investigating how this might apply and whether there's a useful effect that can be um, gathered from these devices and can design, design devices more effectively. So here's a very simple example. You've got a regular in, uh, array of insertions and you inject a source at one end and you measure it at the other end you look at, uh, to see what the results of that will actually be. And this is kind of an example that you see here. And you get these band gaps, which effectively where the phase cancellation effects are happening. Um, and so we've done a little bit of work with verifying the models where we built our own sonic crystal, which you see here, which we took measurements in our anechoic chamber. And you can see that you've got, again, there's an additional band gap here. We're not quite sure where that's in our structure. Um, but you can see the, the theoretical band gap is there and lines up with kind of almost lines up with the result that we've got from our models. And what we're particularly interested in as well is these are quite, quite sort of unesthetically pleasing devices, but obviously you start with something simple. And we're trying to move towards this kind of design, which is called a gyroid design, which again gives a, um, an optimal filling of a three-dimensional space with gaps, effectively. And so we've been doing a little work on modeling those. And this kind of, again, is about subjective testing. So we've been going out and doing sound quality measurement work and measuring soundscapes and then bringing them back to the lab and rendering them on our multi-speaker listening room. And then we're designing these effectively filters, what we're getting from our simulations, and we're filtering the sound to see whether they actually make much of a difference. And again, there's an extensive listening test going on right at the moment to see whether if we placed a virtual sonic crystal in the soundscapes that we've gathered, would it actually make a difference in terms of the sound quality? Can you actually hear the results? Okay, so um, I'm going to again skip on a little bit uh, in the last five minutes. I want to move to our small spaces, our smallest spaces, which is thinking about <clears throat> our vocal tracks. So the vocal tract, if we think about it from what we've been talking about so far, is just a small room. So Unfortunately, it's a small room that's kind of moving all the time and it has uh, a very high level means of control and it's got a particular type of source and we get from it an acoustic output that we obviously interpret as speech um, and so it's a particularly tricky thing to try and simulate. But the first work that was done on this was in 1961 by Kelly and Lockbaum that took some x-ray information that, that um, uh, took the vocal tract uh, 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 diameter and mapped it as an area function varying from glottis to lips and then constructed a, a model that consisted of one-dimensional concatenated tubes and this can be simulated using a bi-directional delay line or a digital waveguide as one might think of it by exciting the space appropriately or exciting the model appropriately and this is using the Lillikrantz font glottal flow excitation model um, then it's possible at the other side of this to simulate things like vowels and so this resulted in the first kind of singing uh, computer, which was this, which was done with Max Matthews at Stanford. I won't give you the full thing because we'll be here for a while. 
which of course then also gave us this, which I think is, we won't skip this, we'll have a little bit of a close encounters, uh, where Hal goes mad and is shut down. So we go on. But that harks back to the first work of Kelly and Lockbaum and Max Matthews. Um, so we did some work on how we could improve the basic one dimensional model uh, by moving it to two dimensions. Uh, and this enabled us to actually articulate the model as well. And so this was done using the waveguide mesh rather than finite difference technique because there's an extra variable that we can use in the waveguide mesh algorithm that usually gets factored out, but we can, use, we can update this dynamically, which enables us to build a stable model that we can actually change and control over time so that we can actually start to produce something that's vaguely speech-like. So we developed something so that enables us to do that, and these sliders correspond to sort of constricting areas of the vocal tract, uh, effectively changing the tube shape, if you think about it in a one-dimensional sense. And we could work with this system called Apex, which was developed by colleagues at KTH in Stockholm, which again uses X-ray data and articulatory voice synthesis to generate, um, again, the vocal shap vocal tract profile and from that we can plug it into our model and we can make our two-dimensional model speak and it sounds like this it's not quite as good as daisy i'm afraid so it's only very good at doing vowels and plosives because you can close the lip end and so you get good, reasonably good b's and d's and that's why we synthesize that because it's mostly vowels and b's and d's but just to round things off we've recently been doing some work on 3d vocal track modeling and we've been doing this based on magnetic resonance and working with singers. So we took five subjects, all trained singers or phoneticists. We recorded them standing up and lying down in an anechoic chamber with a headset microphone and a laryngograph EGG electrodes to get the voice source. Uh, their headphones were, were given to them so that they got MRI noise because MRI machines are very, very noisy if any of you have been in one uh, and can be quite distracting. And we were testing that they'd give consistent results whether they were standing or lying down. And it also changes the, you know, the articulation of the vocal track slightly, so there's a quite a little bit of a change in the overall response. Consistency of performance, and also that they could sustain a note, because they have to sustain a note consistently for the scan procedure to take place. So we got this down to a 16-second scan time, which gives us uh, a final resolution of our MRI images of 0.75 by 0.75 by 1 millimeters. So we take the data, which looks like this, uh, and then we have to do a little bit of manual editing of it um, to, to occlude the teeth and the trachea and basically get the vocal tract out of what can be quite a complex sort of thing going on here. So the dark areas is where the vocal tract is. There's our tongue. That's where our teeth should be. There you can see the sort of the nasal cavity and so on. From that, then, we can separate out the vocal tract information that we're interested in, and we've got a three-dimensional model of the vocal tract shape. So, okay, it's kind of similar to what we've been doing with our rooms in Blender, but it's a much, more di you know, it's a much different scale, obviously, and the detail is much more critical. From that, then, we do again, effectively, we do a, a voxelization of, the, of the, the, the small space that we've extracted from our MRI images, and we've done this at very, very high resolution to get the capture the, the kind of the fine detail of the vocal tract. And you can see here, this is the 3D tract image, and we can see as we go up in sort of a resolution of, of sampling grid. From this, then, we take our small space, and in this case, we've done it with a digital waveguide mesh rather than a finite difference time domain model, um, and we can capture from that 10,000 point impulse responses in about 30 minutes, and that's at a very high sampling rate. I think that was at uh, at least 192 kilohertz, those examples, I think, if I remember rightly from the work. Um, and the results we get are as follows. So um, this is for one of our sources, and we can see here um, the acoustic recording information that we got before and after is in the red lines, both dotted and dashed. The simulation with the source is the black line, and then the simulation, which is just an analysis of the vocal tract resonances, is the blue line. And we can see that we get very good um, uh, matching between 
the acoustic material and the simulated material. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, the vowel I as in jib, real first and then simulated. I won't play it all because they are 16 seconds long and it's just kind of one note being sustained. Uh, and the first is what's been captured from our poor singer lying down in our anechoic chamber and you can hear a bit of spill from the headphones of the MRI noise that we're playing at them. And he sounds like this. Sorry, that's the source. So that's we've got from the glottis and then we get the real one here and the simulated one and by way of comparison again source will do then the real recording then simulated in 3d simulated using our old 2d method and then using the traditional kelly lockdown method so we have and real, 3D, 2D, and 1D. So interestingly, they all sound different, yes? But certainly the 3D one, I hope you agree, sounds closest to the real one in terms of having a particular we would say natural or human quality to it. Part of that's because the source material we're using has come from that person. So it's, that, it's their electroglossic, uh, electroglossograph uh, source that we're using as the excitation to the model. But certainly there's something about the 3D model that uh, is a sense of naturalness. So we've just published a paper on that. It's more on the method rather than on that study. And we've got another paper in process where we're writing up all the work of the MRI data. And again, we're going to put the whole lot online for people and researchers and colleagues to go and explore. So some summarizing a crash course in all the work we do in the audio lab in virtual acoustics. Um, finite difference time domain methods provide a good means of accurate room acoustic simulation and in more recent work we've tested this in sort of in more kind of critical sort of room acoustic scenarios. In particular boundary models give good results in terms of frequency, de um, frequency dependence and diffusion but you have to calibrate them first of all that's very important uh, to other geometric methods and blender is providing a nice open source extensible tool to do the design time work that we're doing hybrid modeling strategies give a good compromise in terms of accuracy and computational effort um, although soundscape oralization is opening up new challenges to us in terms of the types of sound source we need to deal with the types of environments we need to simulate and the fact we're not dealing with a nice closed bounded space anymore so that's uh, new things we need to think about there and digital waveguide methods uh, mesh methods still have a role to play particularly if you're for instance with the vocal track we want to do something that's dynamic potentially moving towards real time and that's a little bit more tricky to do with the finite difference method we've found so far um, so future work um, optimal boundary implementation is something that we're interested in at the moment the the proposals that are that is, exist in the literature give a one-pass solution to designing your, your boundaries and we're kind of finding that maybe that's not the best way of doing it particularly if we want to hybridize the result and it's probably just as effective maybe more so to solve the problem in octave bands and the boundary becomes a lot more simple then you need a much more simple filter which lends itself to quicker implementation and it lends itself to quicker computation and the results effectively we hope we uh, suggest are equivalent a lot of work in the perceptual evaluation of our models and also you know, at the moment it's a brute force technique we're throwing lots of computational power at the results but how much of it do we critically need to simulate how much of it can we throw away because we don't ever hear the difference um, and you know with the, 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 kind of the, the parallel there is mp3 and the fact that if cd was being designed again they'd have never built all that bandwidth into that medium um, without using it more effectively Walk through oralization is also a goal. Obviously, we, also, we want to move to a place where we can interact with these spaces once we design them and make changes on the fly and listen to the results immediately rather than having to farm things off to um, computing grids or GPUs to get the results for us. And with our vocal tract, we've got some nice static results now and we want to improve the source modeling because at the moment it's just taking an impulse response projecting the source into it. We want to have a, a more uh, reactive model where we model the source directly and then also make it dynamic so we can, again, speak in three dimensions. Thank you very much for the attention. I hope it didn't, you know, didn't try and cram too much in there. Um, if you want to ask me any questions, I'm happy to. Otherwise, there's my contact details. And I've got to thank, of course, all my various colleagues and collaborators in the audio lab and elsewhere that have helped in various aspects of this work and contributed to the papers I've cited there. Thank you very much.
Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, at the moment, we're basic, you know, Odeon and similar comes with, you know, a library of acoustic absorption coefficients for avaringy or diffusion coefficients. And again, a lot of that's available in literature and in standards. And so basically, when it comes to doing the absorbing boundary information, we're taking that, that same library of information and interpreting the uh, absorption coefficients and building that into the boundary, either as a complete frequency dependent response. So we have to take and that's what I'm kind of suggesting in the last slide. At the moment, you take the octave band absorption coefficient data and you have to design a filter to fit that. Um, and then you plug that filter into your finite difference time domain method at every boundary point, and then you get the result at the end. But that filter design process is, you know, there's, there's, that has to be checked to make sure that you get stable and accurate, and it adds significantly to the modeling time. So it's actually much more efficient, we think, to do, and we haven't tested it fully yet, but to basically take just single octave band information and simulate it much more effectively, much simpler boundary, and then just do a sort of a band pass filtering of the result of your various impulse responses at the end, which is how Odeon and, and CAT do it effectively. They, they simulate in octave bands. So the data comes from um, typical libraries that you can get. However, one thing worth mentioning is in the hybrid solution, this one here, you have to take some of the reflection information and either interpret it as normal or make to find out whether it's normal instance reflection coefficients you've got or random instance reflection coefficients you've got because the, the, the simulations will behave differently depending on which value you plug into the filters that you've designed for your boundary. So um, for image source and beam tracing, because that's mostly t picking up early reflection type information, we found that normal instance reflection coefficients are better for the acoustic radiance transfer method, which is more about the diffuse field simulation, you use the random instance coefficients. So there's a little bit of, again, optimization and adjustment that needs to be done with the data once you've got it to make it fit the models and how they're working. It's a good question. Still work to be done there, I think. Yeah, just in that, in that particular model, what's your um, the cutoff frequency when you switch from finite difference to...? It, that depends on how long you're prepared to wait. Ultimately, so uh, I think uh, I think this one was done at to give us a 10 kilohertz bandwidth. Yeah, so you can see it there. There's the cutoff. It's at 10 kilohertz. So this will have been, I think, the finite difference method would have been sampled up to 30 kilohertz and then downsampled or effectively cut off at 10k to give us something that's valid up to that point to minimise dispersion error effects and to minimise the other artefacts you get with a finite difference approach, um, and that becomes our cutoff then. And that was taking still about, you know, if I remember rightly, on a GPU for a space of that size, it was still a case of days rather than hours. So it still takes a long time. And that's one of the problems there because we're massively oversampling the grid to get something that's going to be valid for 10 kilohertz so that we can effectively downsample to what we want. There is some coffee. There is some coffee. Oh well. Any, any other questions? I was going to just ask one thing, and that is that you mentioned the, the idea of using this hybrid approach with different simulation methods at over different frequencies, and that's partly done because you don't quite have the computation exactly. um, yeah. power yet. Yeah. But assume that presumably in not too long that power will be available, so do you? see yourself ditching this kind of method? Or well, is, it going to have, is it going to have value when you have more computing power? I think, I think it, we, 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 we debated that. Um, and, and that's why we're interested in the fact that at the moment, at some point, to get your finite difference model to work accurately and give you results that correlate well with real world measurements, at some point you've got to design the filter and you've got to plug that filter into the boundaries and make sure that, that filter is stable and make sure it's behaving the way you want it to behave because there's only limited information that you can get to design that filter from, for instance, acoustic absorption coefficients. So that's kind of where we think 
the work to be done is and it's whether that filter design process is more optimally done before you simulate or whether you take a simpler design approach in terms of how you do the simulation and then you, you optimize it afterwards by bandpass filtering the results. Um, and the good thing about that is potentially it means that you can farm off the computing load over a grid quite easily. And so that grid of, you know, the, the grid that, that the computer science have got is just standard CPUs, but that could be upgraded to a GPU grid in years to come, in which case you get very, very quick modeling done. But it, this also enables you potentially to do many more models at the same time and try different things out at once. And everyone will take the, uh, the, the equivalent of, of one bandwidth worth to, to simulate, I think, effectively. So um, it's a good question. Um, ultimately, if you want to do it, in, if you're m moving towards real time, walk through oralization, then this approach isn't going to work. You've got to do everything in one go. Um, so that's, that's one case where you would have to do it like that. But in terms of design work, optimization work, and farming off your processing load, then at the moment we think this has the edge, but we're going to try and produce, we're going to produce a paper for ICA in Montreal that hopefully kind of looks at the pros and cons of these methods. Okay, I think that's all for the time really. Thank you very much for coming once again and thank you. Thank you very much.